I got started as a trainer actually in Colorado. I started mostly working with young horses and difficult horses. And what happened was through high school, I learned that I could make a living riding problem horses and starting young horses. And I thought that was the best thing in the world. Like I loved my job and I loved that I was able to make money doing what I love. And I never really looked back from that moment. It's 626. We leave, I think she said like five o'clock in the morning, something like that. See, the thing about when it rains in California is it's like it shuts everything down. Sweetest horse ever. <laughs> That's exciting. That was awesome. That was it's cool awesome. to see them like out in the field so happy. Huh? That was awesome and so friendly. Yeah. Alright, enough shenanigans. Let's roll. Levi, this is my sister's dog. Hi, buddy. Hi, buddy. We get to go swimming today. So starting out, it was a lot of young horses and difficult horses, problem horses. And most of the clients were amateur clients that maybe didn't want to get bucked off or didn't want to get hurt. And they needed someone brave and someone that would work with their horse and kind of show their horse the way. And I worked very closely with a guy in Colorado by the name of Larry Fleming. And he helped me get started because that's what he did. He worked with those same type of horses. And um, he helped me get started working with those clients and figuring out how to, how to build a business doing that. That's where I really fell in love with riding horses. I fell in love with kind of the problem solving aspect of it. How do I set things up that the horse understands? How do I make it present something in a way that works for that individual horse? And sometimes in the beginning, the problems were super, super basic. And I loved working on those, like a horse that's difficult to get in the trailer. And figuring out in my mind, how do I set this up that the horse understands what we want and that we can work with them mentally and kind of gain their trust that then they let us help them in the trailer. Instead of trying to pressure them in the, into the trailer, we can let them find a way to follow us into the trailer. And so working with those, those basic problems that's where I really fell in love with this. He looks fat and happy. <laughs> yeah, he has to lose a little bit of weight, I know. But look at the grass, he's so happy. I didn't really fall in love with dressage right away. As a kid, it was far too regimented for me. Uh, I didn't like the lesson format. I didn't like 
feeling like I had to work on my position all the time. And um, I liked being a wild teenage kid riding around chasing cows. Um, when I did fall in love with dressage, it was when I had a horse and I was actually working on getting the horse sound. I was a farrier for a little bit and I was working on this horse's feet. And he was a big warm blood horse. And I ended up getting this horse sound and he was mine to ride if I wanted to. And I started riding him um, and that's really when I started getting interested in dressage because when you have a horse that's physically talented for dressage, you're kind of drawn to it. I think anytime you get a horse that's physically talented in a certain way, whether that's reining or cutting or whatever it is, it makes you want to help them kind of, it makes you want to show off their talents and kind of do them justice for the talents that they have. I think from, from then on my career continued to go a lot of problem horses, a lot of young horses and I would still cycle through horses that were more talented for dressage and horses that were less talented for dressage. I think what's interesting is that didn't stop me from like really loving the horsemanship aspect, the problem solving aspect. And like I use the term problem horses but I don't really believe in problem horses existing. I believe horses do what they're taught to do. And so I loved working from the problem solving way on my side of things to help the horses understand what I wanted them to do. Right around the time that I moved to Stefan's barn, um, I got a horse to ride that was at the time a problem horse. And he was a very talented horse that um, could be quite difficult. And I got, I got the opportunity to ride this horse and work with this horse for quite a long time. And he was the first horse that I was able to show in the Grand Prix. And I showed him twice in the U25 Grand Prix. And um, that, like to this day, that's one of the biggest accomplishments of my career, figuring out how to show and how to get this horse to the Grand Prix. Eventually, over time, I didn't, I didn't really want to push problem horses away because I loved these horses. Like George, for example, I absolutely loved riding that horse and he was a fantastic horse. But I've always had a desire to be competitive and I've always wanted to be extremely competitive in dressage. And so I've thought about, I, I know 100% that to compete in dressage, you have to have a very special, very capable horse. And that changed my career path a little bit. And I, I was always kind of looking for a way to get the most talented horses and be able to ride and have access to those horses. And that never really kind of materialized, that never really started to take place until I met Jessica. And she, she was really the one with the vision to say, we can, if we were to start a sales business, and we were to go find amazing horses and bring them over and sell them, that then we got this ball rolling where we were bringing horses over and selling them, then we could build a foundation where we had a lot of young horses. And there's an advantage to that. There's an advantage that if you're going to Europe and you're looking through a lot of young horses, you get better at evaluating what's there. And if you're better at evaluating what's there, then you can pick and choose better and better horses over time. I think any 
top rider will tell you that having a horse that competes at the top level of dressage, the very top, that it's some, in some ways you're lucky. You're lucky if you have a horse that competes at the very top. And that being said, you can increase your chances of competing if you have more depth. So if you have more options of what you're choosing from. If you can evaluate more young horses and train 10 horses, then you have better chances of reaching the top of the sport. That's kind of what we're trying to do with EDI. Bring in a lot of good horses. Do I think that EDI will sell top quality horses? Yeah, like there's been so many horses, like a lot of EDI horses that I wish we could keep, that I really do believe in, and I believe in their futures, and it is difficult to sell those ones, because I do believe in them, and I do believe in them as incredibly competitive dressage horses with a future for this sport. That being said, I think the goal of EDI is to grow and to sell amazing quality horses. And that makes me happy too, because I know that I'm selling a good product, that I'm, I believe in the horses that I'm selling to these people. Um, but I also think that EDI will have its own space where I will get to keep a horse and compete it and develop it. And I, for me personally, I don't want to buy a horse that's that's already doing the Grand Prix. My goal is to buy a young horse and develop it to the Grand Prix. And to do that and to be competitive, I also know that I need I need a lot of options and I need to be able to develop multiple horses because Ultimately, doing the Grand Prix at that top level of the sport is incredibly difficult. And it's incredibly rare to find a horse that is that quality. That is quality enough to compete at the top of the sport. It's definitely, EDI is, like the past year with EDI, I've, I've ridden the best horses of my entire career. And that it's a weird place to be in, coming from riding mostly problem horses and young horses and difficult horses to now riding what I consider some of the best quality young horses that I've seen. It's a change, it's a change for me. Check this out guys, perfectly groomed arena. Nothing better than when it's fresh. My, people ask me sometimes what my overarching goal is. And it's, it's not to go to the Olympics. It's not even to compete at the top of the sport. It's to be the best horseman that I can be. 
And going all the way back to the beginning of my career, uh, one of the people that I looked up to the most, Larry Fleming, he didn't compete. And he didn't really want to compete. But he had this kind of tenacity, this desire to be an incredible horseman for the horses. That he could present things in a very clear way and communicate with horses. Uh, and that they understood his language, that he learned their language. And for me, that's, that's my overarching goal, to be the best horseman that I can be, to learn how to speak their language. Mm -hmm.